Yes, here we go. It's uh, PMP after the Champions League opener. We were away to Feyenoord in the Eredivisie. And uh, sadly, it was not the result we were looking for, not the, not the performance we were looking for, not the red cards that we were looking for, and an already injury ravaged squad. Terry, I've not even had a chance to have a quick play the week before we went live. So I will get your thoughts fresh tonight on the bus, mate. I haven't even spoken to in the group chat, and I wasn't even really using it tonight. So, uh, yes, we will get stuck into all that. We'll quickly do all that good stuff. Give us a like, give us a share, slag the hair, all that carry on. If you want to go to piesports.com, it's 12.5% discount using the code BUS1888. Or you can become a voice member, likes of AD1888, Stephen Donahoe, um, we've got Brown Warrior, San Francisco, loads of others as well. Um, but yes, we'll get into all of that. Terry, it was a night of two red cards, two goals for Feyenoord, no points for Celtic. Disappointing, boy, say. Um, a new season, same old sort of Champions League story. We'll pick through the game. There were some some things we done well, other things we, we didn't do well. Ultimately, we come out of it with what we've become accustomed to coming out of these games with, and that's no points. Um, I, thought, I thought first half, I felt it was pretty even. Um, felt there was maybe a 10 minute spell where we really did come into it a little bit and although we didn't create any real sort of clear cut chances we had, we had some half chances which on another day maybe something goes your way the the killer moment was as you and I talk about the, the moment that changes games is, is goals and I was feeling if we could have got in at half time there level you're sitting there thinking do you know what We've done okay here. We're well in this. There, there's not much in this. Overall, I was quite disappointed with Fener. I thought they'd been hyped up to be to be a lot Me better. Than that. I think. I think. I, that. I think. I think. Just based on that ninety minutes, I obviously don't watch them any other time. I would say they're uh, they're just a pot three team dressed up as a pot one team. If I'm being honest, um, that moment changed the game, and we were sloppy. A few times, probably in the the five the five minutes before that, we we were giving the ball away, trying to play out of defence. We had the moment where Maida thought the ball had gone out. I actually think it went out, but it's that old adage: you don't stop. You play to the whistle. We stopped. Looked a bit foolish. Uh, we were giving away some silly free kicks in and around danger danger area, and we conceded a goal from from one of those. And probably from that moment. I just felt we, we weren't going to get back into it. And uh, once once the penalty was given, I know they didn't score it, but once we went down to 10 men, that was pretty much game over. And uh, it kind of just petered out from there. It was an interesting one, wasn't it? The first half, and we could talk about everything in isolation a wee bit. Uh, Lagerbielka picks up his first booking in the first half again. I mean, Hartson, I think, you know, I love big John Hartson because he's just such a Celtic man, right? But I mean, he, I think he was trying to say... Lagerbielka's first touch was unlucky because it bounced it was, off his foot in a, bad di- a, a different direction. And I was like, surely that's the definition of a bad first touch. I he should have got a red card for that touch alone, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, that, that. that's what people need to remember. That was the beginning of the, the red card. We'll talk about the second jail because I'm guessing there'll be a split in the camp with the views regards to that. Um Maida was a bit of a thorn in the side, I felt, in the first half. I didn't think we were all that bad first half. I felt we, we uh, rode our luck a wee bit at times, but I was can expect that no matter what 11 Celtic put out, Terry. Uh, and I did think on the break when, when Maida had his opportunity that he kind of dug out and his left foot out of nowhere. I could have caught the keeper off guard because he's hit it so early. Um, not too dissimilar to Kyogo doing that Ibrox. Wasn't to be a goal. And then, of course, the sucker punch is their free kick right on the stroke half time. What do we always say about that? That you know, it's one of these old cliches, Terry. But it doesn't get away from it. It's a fucking terrible time to concede the goal. Um, talk me through what Celtic get wrong for that free kick. Like I said, in the five minutes leading up to it, I felt we were giving the ball away in dangerous areas. Um, Scales and Lager Belga. I thought they defended all right with balls coming into the box, which is their bread and butter. But the bit, the bit that they really struggled with was their distribution, um, and they were trying to play the ball into McGregor, O'Reilly, Hitati. But at this level, 
that those passes they've got to be crisper, they've got to be faster, they've got to be right on the money. And we were giving the ball away. The, the final one thing they did do quite well, I thought, was they, they pressed us and they didn't give our midfield um, much time on the ball at all. So I felt we were giving the ball away. And then, as I said, stupid free kicks. And if you keep giving those free kicks away, sooner or later it is gonna it's gonna cost you. Um, to be honest, uh, when, when when the guy was lining up the free kick, I I just says to myself, well, he's not surely he's not going to shoot from there. He's not going to score from there. You can't score from there. Um, <laughs> not with it bouncing as well before it reaches even past the goal line. Sometimes you see free kicks and it bounces before think, it hits the net, but think, not before it's yeah. past the goal line. Do you know what I mean? There's a big difference. And it, it wasn't flying, boys. So that ball wasn't flying. It's not as if nah. the guy has, has absolutely caught it sweet and it's it's flying it. There, there'll probably be a split as to it's the wall's fault or it's the goalkeeper's fault. It's it's probably a well, bit of both, to be honest. But even if there was no wall, I would expect the keeper not to get beat from that distance. Well, I wanted your thoughts on that because the wall, when see at first my instant reaction and maybe just a bit, a bit of bias if I'm honest, which I'm not trying to be terribly proud of, was I just instantly went to the, the Joe Hart, you know Joe Hart. Oh, what the fuck, you know what I mean? And then. It's once it gets flagged, I think even by the commentary team, to be honest with you, and you're looking at the replays and you're seeing the wall, it doesn't seem to have done its job either. Let's be honest. It does seem like it's been a bit of a clusterfuck between both. If the wall does its job, it justifies why Joe Hart's that bit further forward, covering his own area of the goal. But there almost seems, if you watch it in slow motion, like for behind, for behind the goal, like Joe Hart does, two movements, Terry. He sort of goes to the left, and just for a split second after his first step to the left, hesitates, then has to make the leap a wee bit more rushed, and he's not made it. And I actually think by the time the ball's in by his, his hands, had he just done it in one sort of swifter movement, there hadn't been, and we're talking about less than a second here delay, I think he actually would have saved that. Uh, I don't know what, I think the reason he's kind of maybe had this wee, I don't know, it, it's not even split second, what do you call it, a millisecond worth of doubt in his movement, he's expected the wall, it's because it's going to hit the wall. But he should have carried on with what he was going to do anyway. And I think he'd have covered it. As for the wall, they've got to be, they've got to be braver, Terry, for me. Yeah, the point, the point of the wall is you, 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 you take up your position, you go where the goalkeeper wants you, and you stay there with the intent of blocking the ball. There were people running out of the wall. Um doing all sorts of stuff because I've noticed this completely absolutely completely and I was listening I didn't I didn't catch all of the half time but um O'Neill was saying just there were some fundamentals with the setup of the wall that he didn't think was right so for example Kyogo was the last man on the inside and he felt that the wall should have been built constructed with the tallest player in that position because that was the position that was most likely for the flight of the ball so to go so stuff like that that probably yeah, yeah. It's so simple. Like I say, you get in at half time nil nil. You're probably sitting going, do you know what, Celtic? This is all right. But then that changes to, right? We're behind. We haven't really looked like scoring, um, and you look at it a lot more negatively. Just goals change games, as boys say. We, we talk about it all the time on this show. Just uh, you could be sitting watching a game and you feel we're not playing well, and then we score a couple of goals, and automatically the the feel good factor takes over again. Go back to the Rangers game, and where I was probably a bit, a bit more downbeat than I should have been at full time. Um, I described that game as one that we won with one moment of quality in an otherwise poor, forgettable game. But because we won it, everybody kind of you forget about all that actually went on in the game. Yeah, uh, exactly. Tonight, tonight, looking back at it, probably I, I felt we were in it up until we conceded. Once that goal went in. I, I did not feel I did not feel we had much chance of coming back into it. When you when you're looking at the cold light of day, we just didn't have the quality. Um we we defended okay with balls going into the box, but that's not enough at this level. The defenders no. are the defenders are the guys that are starting the attacks in the modern day game. And we just didn't have the quality in both from the goalkeeper and the, the defense with distribution. We weren't getting our midfielders onto the ball. And likewise, the midfielders then weren't putting any quality through to the to the attackers. I thought Maeda tried his best, to be honest, and and 
probably himself, Johnson, were probably the, the best performers in my eyes. O'Reilly started well, but kind of faded out of it a bit. Um, Palma never really... Of play since he came back, and it was it was a gamble I would have taken. It was a gamble most Celtic supporters would have taken. Um, I know Hatati Hatati gives the ball away a lot more than most of our midfielders. Yep. I don't know if I'm on this or not. <laughs> My Wi-Fi seemed to go down. What's happening? Terry, are you there? Hello, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I think there's Wi Fi issues happening. Where's both the beauty of live YouTube? Uh, I think Terry's jumped off, probably thinking, You wee bastard, didn't he leave me on, on your own to deal with this? I think I'm a wee bit in a, a wee bit in slow motion, it feels like when I'm doing that. So I don't know what's going on, man. Just, uh, just got to, got to love it. Uh, both got sent off, says San Fran Celtic, yes. Um, I, I'll carry on for a wee bit. If, see if the connection's terrible, just let me know and we can we can call it a night and I'm sure we'll be able to find a way to do it uh, to do it another time. But yes, um very quickly. Um the 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 thing I was um, gonna say about the the second half display is because you go in when you're a goal down. And you've got that negativity. I thought we led up to that goal. I thought there was a nervousness um, about Celtics play the last sort of 10 minutes of that first half that, that took us to that space where it did become a performance. It did become, it led to a goal purely because we just let nerves creep in. I actually thought we started quite bright. I thought we started quite bright. Anyway, come the second half, uh, we just decided to... To start the game as it was, as that second half was, start the second half as it was going to go on. And that's the reality. I think when we got um, into the second half and they then started putting a wee bit of pressure on us, let's talk about the uh, the red cards because it was two in the space of four minutes. Um, Lag of the Elkers. I mean, as we talked about, me and Terry, about the first gen, I mean, for me, Wagabi Elka's first one was terrible. It was a terrible first touch. It doesn't matter about what anyone else says. It was a terrible first touch. And it's led to it. And it's cost us. Um, the second one, he's put his arm out, but his arm's out around like, the player's neck. Now, he's not grabbing or anything like that, but he swung it out. And I don't think the replay, when you're seeing it in slow motion, quite does justice to maybe the pace that's came out at and maybe the length of time. But it's up. That it's just a silly place for it to be. It was a bit of naivety in his part. I don't want to pick on these players. Uh, I call them project project signings because I think that's exactly what they are. Project players will make mistakes, but unfortunately in the Champions League, you will get punished for each and every single one of them. That's just the nature of the beast at this level. And I think there is a right to be frustrated when you see it. Um, I felt, I, I mean, Ian Matheson comes in, great to have you on the bus. He says, never reads. Shocking decisions. I've got to push back on that a wee bit. I mean, I think, Ian, UEFA don't come with this SFA bias that we normally accuse our referees and officials on. I think we've got to look at it like they've had a look from, they've got, you know, knee dog in the fight. They're just looking at it and made the decision they think is spot on. They've, it's went to video referees a lot. We've got to be fair here. Um, we've got to be fair and say they've not got an agenda. There's no reason for them to not give, I mean, they disallowed a goal when they had two things like this. I felt, I felt the lag of Belk when I could see why it was given. I think we'd be, we'd be appealing it the other way around. Um, 
Then four minutes later, Tiago Holmes, he likes to call himself, comes on. And I, I don't know where, I just don't know where his head's at. I, I, I'm not exactly sure what he's thinking about. Has the impact on the players shin been much? No. Is that relevant? No. Not, not so sure. I think once you start diving in, straight leg, foot sort of completely up like that, that is ridiculous. And he does make contact, by the way. Um, regardless of players' reactions, let's not get caught up in all that. Um, I feel that that was real naivety again. And I think it leads us to, you know, I know Feyenoord got a second. Um, at the end of the day, it probably could have been worse. I mean, the third goal was was uh, offside and that was given. So again, bringing balance to the officiating. But I think we need to also have the conversation, which I think was natural after today, no matter what that manner of defeat we got. But if we lost the game, there was going to be eyes then turned to our board. Um, yesterday, they released account £72 million cash reserves at this moment in time. The issue being that um, the reason we have these cash reserves, if you read it, it's like highlighted, I think, by, I don't know if it was just in our group chat, someone highlighted the wee paragraph, the judge, I think, or whether it was doing the rounds online. But it literally says we don't normally qualify for the Champions League, so there's an insistency of having that cash reserve. I mean, to, to be abundantly clear from my point of view on that, Celtic have no precedent ever for I needing to have £72 million in the bank. As far as I'm concerned, the biggest rainy day ever came with COVID. We were covered for it. Also, in that COVID season, we didn't make the Champions League. What I thought we were under the impression we had to sell players, sell at least one player to make up for the shortfall of not qualifying for Champions League. Now, it turns out, turns out that we're to need 70 million sitting there. I feel when I look at that squad that we started with today, that was not acceptable to be tooling any Celtic manager, Brendan, or whether it still be Ange in situ, for a second group stage campaign in a row guaranteed group campaign. So this wasn't one that we had to sort of wait to make our move sort of thing and, and see if we navigated the playoffs. No. I'm afraid what happened was we had known from May to now when the first Champions League group stage game would be played and that we would be in it. Uh, I find it a, a, I find it mar a, a marvel how they have managed to move the goalposts from we budget for Europa League. If we don't make a uh, Champions League, then we'll sell a player and that'll sort of balance the books. So now, with £72 million cash reserves put out there in public accounts, end of year accounts, we are told, well, we need that in case we don't make, we don't normally make Champions League. Here's an idea to make making the Champions League easier. No one expects Celtic right now, none of us do, to qualify from the Champions League group. None of us do. We accept that. I'll tell you what helps, though. Coefficient points. Our noisy neighbours are quick to remind us that they've earned more coefficient points in the last three years or whatever it's been than us. We should be in that competition to compete, not because that means we necessarily qualify from the group. And I think the board go, well, we make it, and then say we invest and we don't qualify, it was a wasted investment. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, not necessarily. Because if we actually made a stronger investment in the group. Tonight could have been a point. Not only is it another million quid in the coffers for a draw, I think, but also it helps the Scottish coefficient go up and Celtic's individual club one. Then you get another situation. You might win a game or two. Three million pounds for a win each. They would like the sound of that. Also comes massive coefficient points. So for me, I don't think they're looking at the bigger picture. They seem to think... The Holy Grail is qualifying for the Champions League and then we just put the brakes on and we stop. Um, two project players got sent off tonight. You could write that script before it. Am I writing these guys off as potential Celtic players going forward? Not necessarily. Um, no, no, I'm not. Um, but what it does mean is, at that age, coming from the environment they've came from and playing for Celtic, firstly, is a big enough jump for them to try and so I can get their head around this season. To be thrown in for Champions League debuts, playing for Celtic. Uh, no. And in a game that we were in, by the way. That's the reality. 
this wasn't overawed by the occasion in the sense that we were getting backs to the wall absolutely pumped, you know what I mean? It wasn't like that. Um, for me, uh, I think there'll be a lot of people now using the evidence of this group stage campaign, no matter which way it goes, and then comparing it with what we feel we tooled our manager up with going forward, um, or going forward when he came in. And I'm not quite sure it's even a stronger squad for the Champions League than it was last year. For me, that's unforgivable. That makes no fucking sense. There is no point in regularly qualifying for Europe's biggest competition not being a bit better each year. Uh, I mean, as for 70-odd million, that's just a slap in the face, I think, to so many amazing Celtic fans out there who spend fortunes on the club year on year. They accept all the price rises that come with that. But Celtic do not want to move with the times, whether it be wages, transfer fees, or fuck all else. They will stay still. Well, the rest of the world keeps moving on, keeps moving on. They've got to a stage now. There is a generation of fans that don't understand what it's like to win in Europe, actually condone how the board do it, go about it and seem to feel that this is us at our glass ceiling. That is called conditioning. You're conditioned to think that way once a whole generation, if not two generations, are a part of that growing up. And that is the message they're trying to get across. I, for me... Always keep an eye on the board. Always do it. I'll go to some points in the live chat before I go. Apologies that the PMP's not been its usual uh, format. I dropped off, then Terry obviously dropped off, thinking he was getting left in his own. I made a, a comeback, and then Terry has already fucked off. He's working the next day, so I'm not going to ask him to come back on. Ian McElwain comes in, gate to have you in the bus. Even boy saying the day still got beat. I blame the board, they're holding us back. Well, like I've just been saying, I totally agree. Turkey Murderer, though, comes in. He says, fine road, unbeaten in the Dutch League. Ere de Vichy. If you're on the bus, Turkey Murderer, it's the Ere de Vichy. And he says, they're flying, scoring goals for fun. Celtic did well tonight. Celtic did do well, left well, up to a point. Turkey Murderer, up to a point. And then, I don't know, I just felt like when the wheels came off, they don't, it's not just like the front wheel, do you know what I mean? Or like the spare tyre in the boot. It's fucking all four of them and the spare tyre in the boot that comes off with Celtic in Europe. Um, and that is what happened, unfortunately, again tonight. Uh, it's always it's always disappointing uh, when, when these things happen in Europe, but we have seen it before. Uh, Celtic Girl says, and it is a catch-22. There is a glass ceiling for us and no breaking through it. I disagree. I disagree because there's many... Many ways you could look at it. Is Celtic ever going to be in a position they win the Champions League? No. But the point of the football club, Celtic girl, is to put the best possible product with the revenues gained on the park that isn't going to jeopardise the club's future, obviously. We can do that far more than what we currently are. And that might mean a third place finish eventually in a Champions League. Imagine that. Then you're in a Europa League where our rivals, who ain't even spending what we are, got to a final and now I'm not saying we dropped to the Europa League and that would be a guaranteed next thing but what it would prove is the glass ceiling could be notched, you know, nudged up a wee bit sometimes um, the last time we not won at a knockout tie I was like two or three months old since Stuart Miller fucking hell Stuart you're making me feel old but yes that doesn't surprise me it was uh, Barcelona we beat 2003-2004 uh, certainly beating Barcelona in a knockout tie that must sound alien to you pal completely alien and it shouldn't. And it's not because, again, we still think we should be beating Barcelona regularly or anything like this. Of course we shouldn't. We understand that. But there's got to be a... a you've got to, want to push the boundaries of what the club can do. And I also think Celtic's in a very, very privileged position where they have sold out season tickets continually, time after time, in spite of these feelings in Europe. And I think they've really dinged out on the domestic success. Once trebles, trebles became the norm and those gloating rights became, or bragging rights, I should say, became such fun, no fan wants to miss out. With the European stuff, though, they have took their eye off. I think before, it used to be very much more balanced, but because we've had so much success domestically, we've all got really addicted to that, and because Europe's became such a routine failure year on year, we've became less interested in that. And there you end up having the perfect storm for a board not willing to back the football operation the way they should, in my opinion. Um, 
Plus signs, I thought Liam Scales did very well tonight, by the way. Um, should he be in the team? That's the different debate, and I get that. But he absolutely, absolutely should not um, have been in the starting lineup. But he did very well. Very well. Um, but yeah, what I would hope for is the dust to settle a wee bit and everyone be able to have a fair, a fair conversation about where Celtic are at. You know, maybe come tomorrow, we'll be doing obviously a show tomorrow night to make up for tonight's one, which I'll, I'll gladly come on as well. Um, we've still got three home games coming up. Obviously, I didn't see enough for final tonight to make maybe shit my pants or anything. I think we could certainly go into that game and and aim for the three points that we feel that we could get off them. I, I certainly don't think that's beyond us. Um, and I know that's not the next game, by the way. I'm just basing it on what I've seen tonight. But over the three home games, I just hope we can get something that puts us in with a chance of Europe after Christmas. But if we were to achieve Europe after Christmas, I do believe that would be in spite of the spending and the transfer recruitment this summer, um, not because of, of that factor. Anyway, I will leave you all to it. Thanks for sticking around. There's over 200 of these. Remember, give us a wee like, give us a share, slag the hair if you want to become a member, all that carry on. Um, we're out of here. We'll do a show tomorrow night, though, to make up for tonight's PMP. Um, not quite going to plan, so apologies for that. Uh, but yes, hail, hail. And remember, always keep your eye on this board. Good night. <laughs>